Heavenly Father, I just want to take a moment and pray for Pastor Eli and ask that he pray for me this morning. This morning, Lord, we're going to duel up this message. And so, Father, I pray for Pastor Eli. I pray, Lord, that you would just touch and anoint his words today and allow him to speak your truths to the body. As we talk about the church, we've talked about what it meant to be connected, working together. We've talked about what it means, Father, to, to have a Christian baptism, to, be, to profess with our lives that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Just as we today profess that you have called us to help to assist, to redeem your world and its creation. So I pray today, Lord, that the words of Eli's mouth and the meditation of his heart would come forth this day, and may the listener have an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord would have to say. Pastor E. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I also pray for our time. And I lift up Pastor Dave as he speaks your word as well, God. That together we would be unified under one God, under one spirit, under one truth, for one purpose today, for your ch church and your kingdom. God, I praise you for who you are and all that you do. I thank you for your people gathered here today to hear from you. Give us cultivated hearts to receive your word, that it might produce a mighty harvest for your kingdom. I do pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated. So as we continue on this mini-series called The Church, God has a plan. Amen. Amen? Yeah. God has given us a vision. Amen? Yeah. Okay, let's start all over. <laughs> I can see some of you are thinking about, why didn't I go on spring break? Well, you're here because God needs you here today. Okay? So let's start over. God has a plan, and God has given us a vision. I seen that. That's my vision. <laughs> was that your magic Cute finger? <laughs> so where was I? God had, no, I'm just kidding. God's plan is to use the people of Crossroads Church to fulfill his vision. Yeah. And the vision of God is to seek and save that which was lost. Or to put it in another word, um, to redeem back the whole world yeah. which was lost. And he, God that is, has given us the resources to accomplish it. And those resources are in us. In week one, we talked about connecting we talked about connecting together as one so that we would be unified in our purpose. Um, we found that in Acts chapter 2, 42 through 45. Then we talked about last week Christian baptism in Acts 2, verse 38, concerning our public proclamation, and that is proclaiming Jesus Christ with our very lives. And that's what baptism does. It proclaims Jesus with your life. And this week, we're going to talk about the resource. I couldn't think of a better day to talk about resources than on a day of green. Green day. That's right, green day on St. Patty's Day, March 17th. Now listen, I did not plan this out. We sat down at the, way back in January and decided to talk about the church in the month of March. And it just so happened, not by coincidence, because I don't believe in coincidence. I only believe in the providential hand of God. That God had a plan for us today, and that's to talk about our time, our treasures, our talents that are in you. Amen. Amen, amen. Time, treasures, and talents. Before we move on, I, I do want to point out something and clarify something this morning that I, too, believe in the providential hand of God, and I do not lean on luck, as my shirt would say. And Pastor Dave actually bought me this shirt. Why would you want to this? <laughs> Just kidding. Hey, listen, time, talent, and... Time, talent, and treasures, and importantly, you. Now, I'd imagine many of us have many things running through our minds at this time, but we're going to begin this morning with time. Right. 
and how valuable our time is. Do you realize that we have 168 hours each week? 168 hours in each week. How many of you this last week just flew by? Right? Just like that. 168 hours. And the question then becomes, when God entrusts us, the church, with resources, stewardship, how are we doing with the things that God has given us? And so we first and foremost this morning, we consider our time. Out of the 168 hours that you have in a week, we are called to invest into the mission and mandate. Amen? Right. To th- therefore go and make disciples in all nations. That's the mission. That's the mandate. To share the gospel. And that looks like all different variances, and that's why it's important that we recognize talents, treasures, but all of us have time. We don't know what that time looks like for this next week. But out of 168 hours that you're given each week, how are you investing that time for the eternal? How much of those 168 hours are you, are you uh, found investing in serving, sharing, sacrificing, encouraging? And hey, wait a minute. How about praying? Right. Right. And in the midst of all that, maintaining work, family, relationships, juggling finances, and no doubt, our schedules. Time is precious. If you don't have a Bible, if you'd raise your hand up, our Bible thumpers would be happy to bring you a Bible this morning. Um, Anybody put it up, and then if you would please, if you have your own Bible, turn to Acts chapter 4. We're going to stay in the book of Acts as we look talk about the church because that was the first church. That was the initial church. And within that church development came the principles that we're talking about this entire month. Amen. From connecting to one another to baptism to, yes, you and the resources. Several years ago, I preached a message on tithe. I don't preach it very often. I don't preach on resources often because I believe it's all his. And if we're doing our part, he'll take care of his part. Um, and But a few years ago, I told you this. I said, um, I used to pray, God, give us more. God, give us more resources. Help us with the resources that we're lacking. And I did that. If you remember, I did that little graph, and I showed that a church our size, um, if everybody was given 10% based upon the capital of, of average salaries in our area, we should be bringing in $2.6 million a year. At that time, we were bringing in about 0.6, 600000 a year. Yet we were accomplishing so many goals. And I was really wrestling with this. And God said, Dave, Dave, Dave. I said, what, what, what? And he said, it's all about your people. I have given them the talents. I have given them the resources. And I have given them the treasures. You need no more than what you have. But you have to use what you do have. And time, as Pastor Eli was just talking about, is... For us, it's, it's the most valuable thing that we have when you start considering sleep and work and taking care of family and running your kids and um, entertainment and hobbies and all these things. How many, I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of us in any given week, 168 hours a week, really spend many more, much more than an hour or two on things that are eternal? Serving, sharing, sacrificing one hour of your time, or as Pastor Eli alluded to, prayer. Giving a little bit of your time to pray for the needs of your family, your friends, of the, of, of the church, of the, of the community, of global ministries. How, how do you, can you possibly give that time? Remember, Jesus even convicted his disciples on that. Can you not pray for one hour? Time is valuable. See, these principles appear in the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 4, I'm going to read two verses for you. Discussing the principles that we're going to apply today and of this entire month. In verse 32 of chapter 4, it says, All the believers were one. Remember, we talked about connecting. We talked about together. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. Please hear it is today. Everything you have, everything you own, everything you are is from God. It is his blessings. 
It is what he has bestowed upon us. He gives them, and he can take them away, depending on how we use them. He says, no one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. How he changes our perspective. How he has changed our lives. And God's grace was so powerfully at work just because of this in them all. God's grace was so powerfully at work because they were one in heart and in mind. And they were one in making sure the needs of others were being met. And in that act of grace, God's power was unleashed. God can do more with the miter's might than he can with millions and millions of dollars because he is God. The church, in its initial stages here in Acts chapter 4, is demonstrated. They were faced with very similar dilemmas that we're faced today. How were they going to carry out the plans of Jesus when he, that is Jesus, was no longer with them? How were they going to get these big, important things done when Jesus was no longer with them? We're going to go after that resolve this morning, but before we go there, I want to, let's consider some of those areas or arenas of life that challenge that thought process. How many of you said an amen to the power of God this morning? Give me another amen. How many of you gave an amen to the power of God this morning? Amen. How many, as Pastor Dave said, that God owns it all and and he entrusts us to do his work? How many said amen? Amen. You see, we believe that. We proclaim to believe that. But sometimes we live as if that truth doesn't exist. Amen. Absolutely. You see, there's a myth out there that I think often distracts us from investing the time connected to the power that God has given us and the resources to accomplish such things. And that that myth is simply that God's not doing what he used to do anymore. There's many people, even in faith and in church, that wrestle with the idea that, you know what, God just doesn't, he's just not at work like he once was. When I look to God's word, I realize the truth is God is still at work today. Amen? Amen. And the way that he works, the vehicle in which he carries out the gospel to continue his work is through time, treasures, talents, and you. you. So where and do you us. sit? Amen. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, the whole three fingers pointing back. But that's why that's I right. point like this when I preach. No. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we can laugh in God's house, amen? See, Come on. even young people can teach you new things, right? <laughs> From now on, I'm pointing, like, pointing just like that. <laughs> That's good, E. But the early church <laughs> demonstrated that, Pastor. Share that with us. So what is, uh, what is the truth about time? Amen. What is it in reality, E? The truth is God is still at work today. And the, and the thrill of this truth, going back to Acts chapter 4, mm-hmm is that God empowers yeah. us that's the truth to do his work see that's what we that's what we miss Amen. all the time Amen. is we think we're out there on our own and and you know you've heard me say many times you may feel like you're on your own but you're never alone that's right. and when you're out there utilizing the talents the time and the treasures that God has bestowed upon you he empowers those things yeah And so those things become something other than the ordinary God is the one that adds the extra to our ordinary. So he takes our ordinary tithe, he takes our ordinary time, our ordinary talents, and he puts extra to them. And they become something beyond belief. As a matter of fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it tells us this. If you will just go, if you will just be willing, 1 Thessalonians says that God is faithful to do the work through you. Right. He'll do the work. He just wants you to go as a vessel to, to the situation and go as a vessel into the world armed with the mission and the mandate. And if we go, you know, people say, I hear this all the time, E. People will say, I wish God would just tell me what he wants me to do. Mm. 
And, and I could just share with you today, you're not going to know until you get out of the boat and start walking on oh, the water. Amen. Amen. Then he's going to reveal. We sit in the boat, we say, Lord, just, just give me something, just give me anything. He never talks to me, he's always quiet. Step out of the boat and see how quiet he is. Get out of the boat and let go of the side. Now, we know you're going to yell, but wait till you hear what he has to say to you. Amen. Because he wants to do his work, and he has called you to be vessels. You and me, you and I, you and us, you and we. I don't know which is grammatically correct, but I'm using them all here this morning. <laughs> because I realize how God works in our world. See, the early church quickly became aware of just how vital their individual roles were. I think if I, was to, if I was to pass out cards and have people say, honestly, right on the card, do you think you're important to the ministry work of Jesus Christ? I bet there'd be a, a I don't want to say a majority, there'd be a lot of people that would say no. I don't think so. The early church believed the same thing because they had just witnessed the power of Jesus, the power of his disciples. And they were thinking to themselves, how could we possibly be anything like them? But once they realized that they were vital, they began to pull their resources, as we see in Acts chapter 4. And as they pulled their resources together, then they discovered that they had as much power. They had greater power because Jesus promised greater things than Jesus did himself. Imagine that. Greater things than Jesus. How about treasures? Amen. I'll dig. let you handle this one. Oh, yeah, thanks. I've preached too many years on treasures. You that. take care of this. So we're going to dig into treasures. Here, here's, I, I've heard this one time, and I really think it's so true. Is that to really understand where the heart of a person is, is to take a look at their calendar and their bank account. Yeah. It's true. It's, it's absolutely true, and, 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 and the gospel's littered with the truth, and, and Jesus taught on these principles connected to that reality. Think about it for a moment. What you invest in your calendar shows where your heart is, right? Mm -hmm. Where your treasures are, there your heart will be also. What you invest your money on, what, what's one, of the, one of the greatest most popular themes of Jesus's sermons, money. Yeah. Why? Because it's so powerful. The enemy knows the struggle of flesh. It's divisive. And yet Jesus empowers us, the church, to be good stewards with what he's entrusted us to. Amen? Amen. You see, money is our number one competitor for our hearts. Whether you believe it or not, or whether you say, well, money doesn't have a hold on my heart, but guess what? Especially in the nation that we live in, money is amongst the top, the number one competitor for our hearts. In Luke 16, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. The word money is translated to mammon. It's the spirit of worldly treasures. And it's, we're so quickly caught up, if we're not careful, into pursuing our hearts and fixing our lives on this mammon, on this money. You see, if we're honest, as Pastor Dave said a moment ago and, and alluded to this word Christian atheist, and uh, I, I taught a series on it, uh, Pastor Dave has preached a series on it, uh, a Christian atheist, you see, we often claim to believe in God. How many of you here believe in God? creator God. Anybody? Praise the Lord. I got one amen. Praise God. Lots of hands up. That's good. So we believe in, we believe in God, and yet we live in many ways as if he doesn't even exist. Yeah. That's a Christian atheist. How many believe in the, in the saving grace of God? He gave his one and only son to die on the cross. Yes, we believe in that. We believe in one God who sent his one son to to die for us for an eternity that we can live with him. And we say, yes, I proclaim that. But do I live it or do I often live as though he doesn't even exist? Mm. 
That's the definition of a Christian atheist. And the same is true, especially when it comes to money. You see, we can give when times are good. We can be faithful with our tithe and our offerings when times are good. But when we hit financial strife and challenges on the lesser things, you see, we often confuse the lesser things with the greater things. Mm -hmm. Woo. We get so wrapped up in upside down and inside down that we get so consumed and overwhelmed by the lesser things. And Jesus taught on that. He says, Does, don't even the birds in the air, are they not cared for? Can I not take care of your needs? Can God not meet your needs yeah. financially and provide for you? Amen. I love the story of Elijah hanging out in the Kareth Ravine and the, the ravens brought him, provided food for him. Man, God can do that. God desires to do that. And I'll tell you, when we begin to trust him, when we begin to what? Trust him. When we really begin to believe in what we say and live that out, acting on what we believe, you will see God multiply his resources in and through you. You see, two things to consider about our treasures. Number one, there's two ways that we trust about money. We trust often in money for happiness and security. I want to say that again. I want you to think about that. Where do you find your joy, your happiness? Is it in stuff? Is it in things? We see that, the biblical example, through the rich young ruler, right? He was so happy, Jesus, and he was acknowledging Jesus. God, I, I'll, I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do. And he said, well, go sell your stuff. Think about your prized Thing that you have in life. What if God said, I want you to give that up? Yeah. Security. We see Zacchaeus, Luke 19. His security was so wrapped up in, in the earthly ways. Listen, we've been sitting in, in this prayer series. And I think one of the greatest truths that has stood out is understanding that we have to go after God's will. How many want, how many desire God's will for your life? Amen. Amen. Listen, if you desire God's will for your life, you've got to be willing to go after his ways, his wills, his will, his way. Amen? Amen? We can't go after God's will our way. We will fail miserably. Every time. Every time. But when the Spirit of God and the truth of his word comes together, we can go after his will, his ways. Are you wrapped up in happiness and security where you find your true value? You see, but when we find footing in the faith with Jesus, when we trust him, two things happen. We become strangely content. How many of you have ever stepped out in faith and really begin to trust God, and then God begins to provide, and you become strangely content? Yeah, I have. Amen. I've even lost my way in that. God blesses, and I'm like, wow, God, this is amazing. And then I go off, and then I, and then I find security in, in my own ways, and my own things, and then I think, well, what happened, God? And he's like, look, I'm over here, right? We often fade from where God brought us to and from in the first place. But two things happen when we learn to trust Jesus. Number one, we become strangely content. Number two, even stranger, we become generous. We become what? Generous. Generous. That is not an, a, a normal thing of the world to be generous. It's just not. Nope. But God says give, and it'll be given to you, right? A good measure pressed down, shaken, shaken together, poured yeah. over, will be running over for others see the problem with most most christians today is that we serve money and sadly use god's blessings i want you to hear that the problem and struggle is that we often serve money and use god's blessings yeah. for the self instead of the opposite we should serve god number one amen and he's such a good God that he's going to entrust us with those blessings. And we use it for his kingdom. Dr. Stan Toller once claimed, when we invest together in the future, we do so for people that are still to come. That's right. That's right. Church, your investment today, financial investment today in the kingdom of God through the ministry of Crossroads is establishing the church for my kids' kids. Right. Today, I love seeing kids' time, no doubt. Oh, yeah, 
But I can't tell you how many sleepless nights that I think about the question, what is the church going to be like 10 years from now? Where's the church going to be 15 years from now, five years from now? God has entrusted us with the greatest of resources for such a time as this to build a vibrant future for the church and this community. Amen? Amen. See, although tithe is just 10%, tithe is not about the 10%. It's a good place to start. But this 10% perspective is about the heart. And it's connected to our need to trust. You see, God invites us to let go of the things of the world that we have that has a hold on us. And to surrender with confidence the security we find often in money and begin to trust in God Almighty and in His will and in His ways to discover true joy. How many of you desire true joy over fleeting happiness today? Amen? Amen. Right? The world off. The world will offer you, in the spirit of mammon, the spirit of worldly riches, happiness that will fade away. But in confidence, God offers us a true joy that brings peace and a confidence in doing life. You see, when we surrender to this confidence, our priorities will grow as we begin to trust Him with our tithe. As we begin... As we receive from God, we give. As we give, guess what happens? He gives again. And as he gives, we receive. And as we receive, we give. And as we give, he, we receive. And it's just, man, that's the way God does his work and his economy, amen? amen? And through that, it develops a confidence to trust him, a confidence that will involve a commitment to him, and a confidence that in, will intentionally exclude the self for the things of God. That was a weak amen. Did you notice that? That was weak. Yeah, but it was that settling. Was, it was settling? It was it was stewing. That see, oh, see when there's a di- when there's digesting. a when there's a it was. There was I heard that that holy digestion in the heart. Holy digestion. How cool is that? Come on now. <laughs> it's like stewing on that and you're thinking on hey, that. Hey, his hit his stomach. It did. It okay, is. good enough. I almost, I, 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 let's see that. God invites us to let go of those things that hold on to us and trust him with confidence as we give our tithe. This side this, of the room gets this it. Side, yeah, this side. strong. What's going on? Let's have folks. our ushers come forward and we're going to yeah, take tithe uh-huh. from this side right now. No, I'm just, Notice I didn't hear an amen No, there. no, you didn't. <laughs> no amens. No. I'm shifting seats. I'm sitting over there next time. <laughs> so we got to trust him with our time. We have to trust him with our tithe. You know, it, it always astounds me. Just before going to the last thing in this talents, because we do have to trust him with our talents. I think of how many people have been given extraordinary talents in the church that they're sitting on them or they're underneath their backside in the pews. Mm. Unused. Because we just... We just don't trust him with them talents. Surely there's people better out there than I am. Surely people have more talents and stronger talents in that area than I do. And you know what? Maybe they do, but God did not call them. He called you. Amen. That's what this whole message is about today. And so when we look at this final thing, we look at talents because everything is focused at you Remember that? Uh huh. There you go. See? There you You're going to leave out of here today, and that's the only thing they're going to remember. Appointed folks. When they appointed folks. From now on, they're kids. You. Someone at your workplace. You. Yep, I get that now. But I want to talk about these talents because I want you to beware of individualism. Individual, another word for individualism is selfishness. I know people personally. That would love to do things in the church using their talents if I will make them known. And if they're not made known, they don't want to use them. I'm not here to prop up anybody. I'm not here to promote anyone other than Jesus. Period. That's it for me. So when we look at these talents and we think about 
individualism. We have to beware of individualism. It holds three perils for us. And here's the warnings. First of all, Jesus, when Jesus calls us out, he doesn't send us alone. He is always with us. And as you see in the New Testament, he always sent his disciples out with other people. Notice that. Because when we have self-independence, when I think of independence, I think of things like uh, what's in it for me attitude. What's in it for me, that's an, that's an inward thing instead of what can I do for another, which is outward. So we have to be careful when we talk about our talents to make sure we use our talents for God and for others, not to promote ourselves. And in this day and time, that seems to be a very difficult thing to do. Also, we have indifferences. We really just don't care. We say we do, but we never put our money where our mouth is. We never put our prayers where our knees are. We tell people, oh, I'll pray for you. I'll take you. I'll help you out, whatever you need. But the problem with, with individualism and also with indifference is this. We're never looking for that. I heard a story um, this weekend, and it really blessed me. And it was about this family that every year at Christmas, they look for one person that they can buy a special gift for. One person. And last year, they noticed that one of our, our ladies here in the church who works out with the other ladies, had on these real inexpensive, broke-down shoes. And so they decided that this Christmas, they were going to pull their resource. They were going to buy this lady some expensive workout shoes and bless her because she was committed, she was faithful, she was devoted, and she was in need. And so they pulled their resources and bought her a pair of Brooks tennis shoes. And for those who have Brooks, you know those things aren't, 1999 at Walmart. And I thought to myself, man, I bet nobody asked that family to do that. I bet they just simply seen the need and they filled it. And they took the talents that God had given them, the funds that God had blessed them with, and they took the time to touch a life. And when they told me who that life was, I was, I was blown away because I have watched that person's life go from the pits of hell to the great blessings and the greater blessings of God. Amen. Amen. Beware of individualism. Beware of being independent with the attitude, what's in it for me? Beware, beware of indifferences, not really caring, and be, be um, very aware of what I call individualism. Individualism, I, I define it like this. Edging God out. Edging God out. Notice the first three letters, the letters of these three words, E-G-O. Individualism, egos. They edge God out. For each and every one of us, God has given us talents. You know, I think that's the thing your mom was trying to say, Casey, and I know your dad, Jack, I know how proud you are of Casey, and rightfully so. And I think that's what your mom was trying to say when she said that to me. Because I know she believes in you, I know your dad believes in you. But they never thought God was going to pull these things out of you and these things were going to happen to you. We don't know what's going to happen to any one person that we encounter. This family didn't know what they were going to do eternally for this other person. We don't know, so we always have to be ready. Mm -hmm. We always have to be aware of the people around us and the things that God is doing. We don't have to invent the wheel. It's already been invented. We just have to be a spoke inside the wheel to where God is going. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Eli? You think that covered it? That sounds pretty good. Okay, well, I Come guess on, we're done man. then, aren't yeah. we? Or close to done. Hey, I got a couple oh, of life. Oh, go ahead. I got a couple of life principles. You know me and life principles. I want to give you something to live out, to think on these truths that we've considered today. So what does it look like 
considering our time, treasures, talents, and you and us, what does it look like to live that out? You see, many of us for the kingdom, as Pastor Dave was just talking about, to live outside of individualism is, is rising above the need for a role. Yeah. You see, ministry is not about a role, it's about opportunity. Right. One more right. time. Ministry is not about a role, it's about an opportunity. Amen. Wow, they're getting good. We're getting there. Here's two yeah. life principles to consider. Short and sweet. Think on them this week. Live with others in mind. Come, Come on. on now. <laughs> Say that again. Think on this. Live with others in mind. Amen. Amen. That's a life principle. That's a way that we truly live out the gospel, being empowered to do the ministry with the resources that God has already given us through time, talent, and treasures. Listen, number two is find a need and fill it. Oh, Amen. my bad. Wait a minute. Come on I now. I have my hand in my pocket. Did you fall asleep? I've, Come no. on now. I said, number two, number one, is live with others in mind. Number two is find a need and fill it. Yeah. Amen. Wow. Man. It's not about a role. It's about an opportunity. If you're waiting for someone to show you how to serve the kingdom, crack open the Bible, and most importantly, begin to trust God in your life, with your life and just take a step out and say, God, here I am. Send me. Yeah. He'll direct you. And conquer that fear Come on. of being a lukewarm Christian. Listen to me. That was the problem with the church of Laodicea in Revelations chapter 3. I always have people say, can't you preach out of Revelations? Why don't you teach out of Revelations? Because everybody seems to be scared of Revelations. Revelations is the book of hope. It is nothing else but yep. the book of hope. Yep. And in this book, it challenges the church of Laodicea. That is the church that became lukewarm yep. because God had entrusted them with time, talents, and treasure. And they did not use them for the kingdom. Yeah. Amen. And he spit them from his mouth. Yeah. Be hot or cold. But for the love of my son, be something. Be some, you know what, I, I, I wrote some of these things. Revelation 3, it, it really identifies for us lukewarm Christianity. Um, number one is, they crave acceptance from people more than God. Mm. That identifies a lukewarm Christian. Lukewarm Christians rarely share their faith. Mm. Lukewarm Christians do whatever it takes to be free of guilt. These individuals think more about their life than others when on this earth. They gauge themselves by comparing themselves to others. They want saved without change in their lives. And they only turn to God when they are in a bind. And lukewarm Christians, you often give and only give when it doesn't infringe upon their own lives, their own spending, and their own ways. Those were the identifiable traits of the people in the church of Laodicea. And for God, he challenged them to no longer be lukewarm, but to become hot, to become passionate. That's what that word translates to. Become passionate about the things yeah. that I am doing in your midst. Titus tells us this. In chapter 2, as our praise and worship team makes their way back up onto the platform, it tells us, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, faithful, godly lives in this present age. Lives that serve, lives that share, Lives that are willing to sacrifice themselves for others. Amen. Pastor Dave, I believe we're, we have such a perfect opportunity to step out of the self and into the things of God. This 40 days of prayer is a perfect way to exercise these truths that we've heard today. You see, this Christian atheist thought process, this lukewarm thought process... We often want enough Jesus to get by, but we don't want to go overboard. I believe it's time for the church 
to live out what we claim to believe? Do you have family and friends that need prayed for? Anyone? I do. Maybe this week you need to come down to the church and, and grab one of these prayer directives that will help lead you through an, through an efficient time of prayer, an intentional time of prayer as we pray for others, as, as par- parents learn to pray for your kids, kids praying for parents, as we cultivate healthy, thriving relationships in the church. And that's about giving and out your the time. Church. Amen. That's your time, right? Amen. We also talked about individualism. We talked about indifferences in, um, and things like that. And uh, if you have a talent, mm. don't sit on it any longer. Come on. Amen. You know, we, we sit, we watch TV, and we go, the world has gone to heck in a handbasket. I wish somebody would do something about it. And God says, I did. I created you. Amen. And I gave you talents in this world, which leads us to tithe. And we have, in your bulletins, you may have noticed, we have a new app. And this is um, an app that helps us, helps you when it comes to giving of tithe and offerings. And um, we realize that we're all very busy. And we all forget things from time to time. I get that. So this is to help you not only know the things that are going on in the church, but also to help you be faithful in your giving. God is going to bless you as you bless him with the things that you've used as our ushers are coming and our band is prepared to play here's our prayer today it's a very simple prayer it's a prayer that we would leave this place knowing that God has spoken to us about our time our talents and our treasures and that we would not leave this place and say oh there's another message on money this is a message about you and about what God wants to do in you to redeem his world. Amen. 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 Okay, we're just, I just, he didn't point, so I thought I'd do that. So as our band begins to play, would you stand to your feet? I can't think of a better song to sing during this time than Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we give today, we would give in accordance to your please, good, pleasing, and perfect will. We would give in accordance to your command, not 6.72%, not 8%, not even 9.4%, but 10. And as Pastor Eli said, maybe that's just a starting place for today. Because as we head into the Easter season, we are going to see more and more people. We are going to have more and more opportunities to tell more and more people about Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So I pray, Lord, that you bless these gifts and you bless the giver. And I pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.